Welcome to today's lecture on the knapsack problem. In today's lecture, we're going to introduce the basic formulation of the knapsack problem and discuss some of the reasons why it is an important problem. The basic idea of the knapsack problem is to maximize the value of items subject to a limit on size where all the variables are binary 0, 1. The formulation of the knapsack is fairly simple. We have one decision variable, x sub i, and that variable is 1 if item i is in the knapsack and 0 otherwise. So if you include the item in the knapsack, the formulation, when you solve the formulation, x sub i will be 1, and if it's not in the knapsack, it will be 0. Our parameters are a sub i, which is simply the value of the item i, b sub i, which is the size of the item i, and C, which is the capacity of the knapsack. Now, you, ha you have to have the same units of measure for the size of the item, B sub I, as the capacity of the knapsack. So if your items are in pounds, the capacity of the knapsack, of course, has to be in pounds as well. We have one in indice I. So I is contained in the collection of items. Um, so we, we, we can write that as X sub I, or I, contained in items. Now our objective is to maximize the value of items that are in the knapsack. And the way we compute this is we sum a sub i times x sub i. Now x sub i is 1 if the item is in the knapsack and 0 otherwise. So when you sum x sub i a sub i, what you get is just the, the items that are in the knapsack because the a sub i is times 1 would just be a sub i, and a sub i times 0, if it's outside the knapsack, is 0. We have a limit on the size of the items. And just like the, the, the objective on their value, b sub i, x sub i, this term is essentially, after we sum it over all items, the amount of stuff in the knapsack. And that whole amount of stuff in the knapsack after we sum it over all items has to be less than the capacity of the knapsack, C. Now we have restrictions on X sub i, and we want X sub i to be contained in 0 or 1. And this just is forcing this variable to be either 0 or 1. We can't take half of an item in this formulation of the problem. Now, if you wanted to be allowed to take half of an item, you would just say x sub i is greater than 0 and less than 1, which would mean you could split an item in half. If you wanted to allow yourself to take more of one item, you would say um, integer x sub i um, or fractional x sub i. And we, we have this x sub i contained in 0 or 1 for all i contained in items. Our first example has tw six items that we might want to take along on a camping trip. And these may be things like food or a tent or a sleeping bag. And each item has a value to us on the camping trip as well as a size. And the total amount of items that we take on the trip has to be less than 12 kilograms or else we can't carry it. Now our decision variable in this problem is x sub i, which is 1, if item i is taken and 0 otherwise. Okay? And since we're going to just do it um, without sets in this problem, just as a simple example, you could, have, you could define a set for the value, a set for the size, but let's just write the formulation without using set notation. So we're going to try to maximize the value of the items. Well, what does that mean? Well, let's maximize 10, because 10 is the value of the first one, xa plus 20xb plus 8 xc plus 
three, 1XD, sorry, 1XD plus 11XE plus 22XF. Okay? That's a one there. And we want to maximize the value of the item subject to our limit on size. And so our limit on size is just 2xA plus 5xB plus 3xC plus 3xD plus 4xE plus 10xF, and that has to be less than or equal to 12, okay? So anytime any of these is 1, if we sum those all together, it has to be less than or equal to 12. Now, can we take all the items? Clearly not, because the sum of all those is obviously greater than 12. Now, we also have the bound that x... A is contained in 0 or 1, XB is contained in 0 or 1, and so on. So, or you could just say X sub I contained in 0 or 1. So all of them, A, B, C, D, dot, 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 are 0 or 1. Now, that, that's the basic knapsack problem. And you can see how the values from the table are translated into the problem. Here are coefficients on the value, coefficients on size, and then finally the total size of the knapsack. In our second example of the knapsack problem, we have a slightly more complex example, a little bit more like one that you might actually see. We have the following capital projects, each with different cost and value. And we have a total project budget of $10 million. So we want to pick the projects that are best subject to our budget limitation. And so what we want to do is develop a formulation to maximize the value of the projects minus the cost of the projects. And so this, this is another essentially knapsack problem. So our decision variable, once again, will be x sub i, which is 1 if project i is performed and 0 otherwise. Okay? So if we do the project, we're going, we're going to, the decision variable x sub i will be 1. If we don't, it will be 0. So what we want to do is we want to maximize the value minus cost of the projects. Okay? So in the first case, that would be maximize 1.1 minus 1 x1 plus 3 minus 2.1 x2 plus 1.2 minus 0.5 x3 plus 0.6 minus 3x4 plus 0.2 minus 1.5x5 plus 4.1 minus 2.2x6 plus 2 minus 1.8x7 plus 0.5 minus 0.4 x8 plus 0.2 minus 
5.8x9 plus 10 minus 5.9x10. Now, the variable x4 and 5, you can see, have negative project returns. So if I do project 4, it's going to cost me $3 million, but I'm only going to get $0.6 million back. Uh, so clearly, if there wasn't some other restriction, the, the problem, because of the negative sign in the objective, would never choose to do X4. Now, what are our constraints? Well, this would be subject to a budget limit. And our budget is... $10 million. So the total value of the projects better be less than $10 million. And, or the total cost, sorry, the total cost. So the first pro project costs $1 million, so $1 million x1 plus $2.1 million x2 plus $0.5 million x3 plus $3 million x4 plus $1.5 million x5 plus 2.2 million x6 plus a little bit out of room here plus um, 1.8 million x7 plus 0.4 million x8 plus 0.8 x9 and then 5.9 x10. So the total amount that we spend has to be less than 10 million dollars. we finally have the restriction that we have to do integer projects. You, you know, buying half a machine does you no good. So we'll have a bound on our variable that X sub I is contained in 0 or 1. Without that bound, what would happen is that fractional projects would be allowed and that, that would not be good. Um, because, like I said, usually half a machine doesn't do much, doesn't deliver much value. Now, our, our next question asks us to add a constraint that each department can only do two projects. Okay? And so the first four projects are for the machine shop. And then the next three projects are for assembly, and the final two projects are for paint. So management may say, Limit number of projects to two per department. When I do that, well, the first department, the machine shop, their, their projects are, are one, two, three, and four. So X1 plus X2 plus X3 plus x4 must be less than or equal to 2. And then the assembly is x5 plus x6 plus x7 must be less than or 2. And then finally, paint would be x8 plus x9 plus x10 has to be less than or equal to 2. Now, with this additional constraint, it's no longer a knapsack. So these are our additional constraints. And now you wouldn't call the problem a knapsack. You would call it an integer program with a knapsack constraint. Um, some people would call these maybe side constraints or additional constraints. It's still basically a knapsack problem. Um, but it is different because of these additional constraints and can't be necessarily solved with the same techniques as a knapsack problem. Let's consider an additional constraint. For project six to be performed, project five must not be performed.
okay? So if we do 6, we can't do 5. Now, it doesn't say that we, we have to do either 6 or 5. So x5 plus x6 strictly less than or equal to 1. What would this mean? Well, if we do 5, we can't do 6. And if we do 6, we, we can't do 5. Okay? And this means that, that, that you have to pick one of the two. Now, if we said x5 plus x6 equals 1, that would mean you must do 1. Maybe these are two alternative safety projects, and you have to pick one of the two solutions to the problem. Um, it would make no sense to pick both um, because they're, they're, they're exclusive, but you have to pick one of them. You could also have a situation x5 plus x6 greater than or equal 1 must do 1 or more. Okay? And you could even have x5 less than x6. What would this mean? x6 could be if x5, if x6 is 1, x5 can be 1. If x6 is 0, x5 must be 0. And x5, so this means you must do 6 to allow 5 to be done. And you could also write this as x and that may be a little clearer. So if this is 1, this has to be 1. If this is 0, this could be either 0 or 1. Does everybody see that? This is saying x5 has to be less than or equal to x6. So if x6 is performed, x5 can be allowed to be performed. Um, if x6 is not performed, x5 must not be performed. So we must do x5 to, to we must do x6 to allow x5 to be done. And we can think of a lot of different scenarios um, for dependencies on projects. You know, you must do this project to allow for this project, or these projects can't be done together, or at least one of these projects must be done exactly, or one or more of these projects must be done. And as you add these side constraints, the problem gets more challenging and is no longer a knapsack. Now, this example is slightly more complicated. If you do project one, the value of project two is increased to $5 million. What this, from $3 million. What this would imply is that project one makes project two more valuable, and that's the way that they're, they're dependent on each other. Now, for this one, the easiest way to do it is probably add an additional variable, x11. And we'll say x11 is one if project one and two are performed and zero otherwise. So X11 represents both projects being performed. The value of X11 is what? Well, what's the value of projects one and two? Well, it, it's the value of project two is now $5 million plus the original value of project one, which is 1.1 or $6.1 million. Because only the value of project two is increased, so we still get the $1 million value for project one. Now this is five instead of three. 
So the value 11, and then the cost is the cost of projects 1 and 2, which would be 1 plus 2.1, which is 3.1. Now, the, the issue is that if we do project 11, we can't then go ahead and do project 1 and 2 because we've already done them. So we can say that x1 plus x2 plus x11 is less than or equal to 1. Let's check this constraint. If I do 1... I can't do 2 or 11. If I do 2, I can't do 1 or 11. And if I do 11, I can't do 1 or 2. Now let's think about this first one. If I do 11, I can't do 1 or 2. That's the behavior I want. If I do 2 and 1, I've actually done 11. So if I do 2, in this case, I can't do 1 because it would then be project 11, the joint project. Likewise, if I do one, I can't do two without essentially doing 11. So this constraint here would be added to the formulation. So in order to make this statement, we just had to add an additional decision variable variable that represented doing both projects. And there are several other ways that you could probably work out um, to capture this logic. I think this one's probably the, the, the simplest and most eloquent. But once you add this constraint here, the problem is no longer a knapsack. Solving the knapsack problem. Dynamic programming can be used to solve the knapsack problem fairly quickly um, in order n b time, where n is the number of variables and b is the size of the knapsack. And this is called mp hard in the ordinary sense. We don't have to go through all the combinations of variables, but it is dependent on the data in the problem, which is a little unusual. And we'll be covering dynamic programming later in the semester. Branch and bound with a core set of variables using clever rules to set variables 0 to 1 also works well on many knapsack problems. The knapsack problem is an important subproblem in many integer programming problems um, and by itself in some instances is important to understand when you develop formulations. And formulations are a key item on your exams. There are many extensions to the knapsack. You can consider a multiple choice knapsack problem where one selects one item from each subgroup. For instance, if I'm going camping, I may have own three tents, but I really only need to pick one of the three tents because once I have one tent, the other tents have no value. You can think of a multi-dimensional knapsack or a multi-constraint knapsack with multiple constraints for things like weight, volume, and cost in the case of the camping example. You can think of an unbounded knapsack where each item can be chosen more than once without an upper bound, a bounded knapsack where each item can be chosen more than once with an upper bound, and then finally a fractional knapsack where fractional items are allowed. I hope this introduction to the knapsack <coughs> provides you with the background to understand this important formulation. Thank you for watching today's video.